Yungyat, Skungwehoege, Yungahaga, Gaderi Wawayansta, Toronto, Nigidero. Um, welcome, everybody. It's nice to see some faces back here. It feels like it's been forever since I've seen a number of you, and I look forward to seeing more of you again. Um, do we, we can uncover this now. Can you uncover this so people can see the presentation? Thank you. Oh, there, excellent. Um, and so as usual, I've come prepared with my PowerPoint presentation, which I know you guys love so much. <laughs> and I, I keep trying to make it shorter each time that I come, and I hope that that's okay with you guys. Um, you can go to the next one. And so uh, she's already read a little bit about What's the best word? So should I just say next? She's already read about this, about Jordan's principle. And the reason why I want to talk about this today is because it's just in two days on May 10th. And so I wanted to educate uh, a number of you because ca most Canadians don't know uh, about um, Spirit Bear Day and why it's important and why it should be important to Canadians. So a lot of times when I talk about reconciliation, which as we all know is a buzzword in Canada, a lot of people don't know what it really means or how to actually get there. And a lot of time when I do workshops, people say, well, what can I do? What actual steps can I take to contribute towards this? And so this, uh, I'm gonna be talking to you today about some steps that you can actually take in practice, um, in reality, uh, where we can start moving forward. Okay, next. <laughs> um, and so you can uh, pass forward to the next one as well, too. So Jordan's principle is a legal rule that's named in the memory of Jordan River Anderson. And you can read some of this, but I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. Um, Jordan River was a young boy in Manitoba who was sick his entire life. And he never got to spend a single day at home. He was so ill that he was in the hospital system and he actually didn't receive the health care that he needed. Now, if he was not an Indigenous child, a First Nations child specifically, so uh, a status Indian child, he would have gotten the care that he needed right away and he might have lived. However, because he was a status Indian child, the provincial government and the federal government fought over whose jurisdiction, who should pay for his health care. And so instead of caring for this young human who had human rights, who had Indigenous rights, who had health care rights in this country, they didn't give him the care that he so richly and rightly deserved. Instead, they just fought, oh, you pay this bill. No, you pay this bill. No, you pay this bill. And this went on for years. And tragically, when he was only five years old, he passed away. And this, like so many other needless deaths of Indigenous people in this country, uh, brought, you know, made this, made so many people very, very angry, you know, caused so much hurt and trauma in the Indigenous community, and yet was just another statistic to the government of Canada. And so the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society led by, and I've mentioned her to you guys before, Cindy Blackstock, which, who is a social worker um, and then an advocate in BC and eventually realized that they needed to set up this First Nations Child and Family Caring Society because so many children in the system, so originally the um, child welfare system, but then more broadly than that, needed help and support, went to Jordan River's fam family and asked if they could use his name um, to move forward on this principle. And they did, they gifted his name. And so now we have Jordan's principle. And so sadly, disputes between the government, the federal government and the provincial government, because healthcare is provincial, but jurisdiction over status Indians is federal. So these types of arguments still continue to happen to this day over, over healthcare, over education, over all kinds of things to do with status Indian people. And so again, status Indians are 
indigenous people who are recognized by the government to fall under the, the legislation of the Indian Act. So for example, I'm a status Indian. Both of my parents are status Indians. Um, we've talked about this before because I've, I've given the lecture on the Indian Act. And is that is that lecture still available um, on the website? Because I know you've had it. It is. It is that that lecture is still available if you want to go back to that lecture on the Indian Act that I've given before. Um, to go on to the next one, please. So Canada's response. Unfortunately, the federal government did not implement Jordan's principle as the family had intended. So despite unanimous support in the House of Commons in 2007 for a broad definition, meaning let's just apply this principle to everybody so that no matter what status Indian child goes into the healthcare system, they all just get healthcare right away and you can deal with the bills later right? Because if it was not a status Indian child, everybody else gets health care right away. And you deal with the bill later as well, too. Um, however, the federal government went on to implement Jordan's principle in a manner that was so narrow, that very few First Nations children qualified. And for what reason would they do this? We must ask ourselves. And so think about 2007. This was at a time when Harper was our prime minister and all kinds of things were being cut back. Um, all kinds of charities were being cut, all types of indigenous organizations ceased to exist. Um, there was a very strong conservative agenda. And also this was the time when the United Nations adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So this is what happened in 2007. And out of the 167 countries, um, within the United Nations, all of those countries, except for four, adopted, immediately adopted, astoundingly and almost unanimously adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, except for four. And those four countries were Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and yes, you guessed it, Canada. And so Canada... Um, refused to accept it. And there was so much backlash against Harper at that time, just to give you context to this era, for years that finally in 2010, Harper finally said, fine, as a PR stunt, we will accept UNDRIP. However, it'll be according to our existing laws that, it, that are here in Canada which means it meant absolutely nothing, which means it would still fall under the Indian Act and, and all the other laws that existed. Um, so he didn't really do actually do anything. And as a side note for us with UNDRIP, it wasn't actually fully adopted until 2016 um, by the minister. Um, and even then they didn't ratify it. So an international declaration that's not ratified has no basis in law in this country, which is why I thought with a number of others, where did you say mine was on the right? My water, thank you. One moment. Which is why I fought with a number of other groups uh, for Bill C-262 from 2016 to 2018, uh, which went all the way, its way through parliament, but didn't make it through the Senate. And then we ended up with Bill C-262 15, which uh, finally just passed in Parliament in June of 2021, which means that UNDRIP now, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People finally has a basis in law. So from 2007. So to take us back to 2007, it was a time when the government did not want to include the rights of Indigenous children, um, did not want them to have access to health care, um, didn't want to be part of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous uh, Peoples. And so this was completely unacceptable because more Indigenous children kept dying. Next. And so it was at this time as well, too, that 
First Nations Child and Family Caring Societies, um, uh, First Nations Child and Family Services across Canada, so in each province, because those are provincially run, um, started talking to each other. They started having provincial societies where they could talk about whatever their different issues were. And the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society was created by Cindy Blackstock. And it was developed in the Squamish Nation in 1998 at a national meeting of the First Nations Child and Family Care, uh, Service Agency. So those were the provincial agencies that were kind of like the, um, the, the head agencies of each provincial um, or membership of all of the child and family services. And meeting delegates agreed that a national nonprofit organization was needed to provide research, policy, professional development, and networking. And what they didn't realize was how much advocacy and the legal advocacy was gonna be lying ahead of their journey. And an interim board was elected and the plan was approved at a second national meeting in Kingsclare First Nation in 1999. Next. So the Caring Society works to ensure the safety and well-being of First Nations youth and their families through education initiatives, public policy campaigns, providing quality resources to family and support and communities. It uses a reconciliation framework, which you can find on their website, and that addresses contemporary hardships for Indigenous families in ways that uplift all Canadians. It's ways that actually supports all of us. It strengthens all of our communities. It strengthens all of our healthcare systems. It strengthens education systems for all of us. And it helps First Nations children and their families so that they can grow up safely in their own homes with their own families and helps them to achieve their dreams, celebrate their languages and cultures, which is in alignment with the Human Rights Code. It's in alignment with UNDRIP. It's in alignment with every declaration that Canada has ever signed. Um, and it's also just in alignment with ethics and morals and most communities of faith as well, too. And so the Caring Society works in partnership with the Assembly of First Nations and with another of other organizations as well, too. Next. So this is Spirit Bear. Welcome to Spirit Bear. He is a member of, or they are, I don't know if they have gender pronouns, um, so I'm not really sure. Um, the member of, a member of the Carrier Sakani Tribal Nation, Spirit Bear represents the 165,000 First Nations children impacted by the First Nations child welfare cases at the human, Canadian Human Rights uh, Tribunal, as well as the thousands of other children who have committed to learning about the case and who have taken part in peaceful and respectful actions in support of reconciliation and equity. So Spirit Bear joined the, the Caring Society team in 2008 and immediately committed himself to witnessing all of the tribunal hearings. In June, 2017, Spirit Bear was actually awarded an honorary barrister degree from Osgoode Law School. In October, 2017, he was officially admitted to the bear of the Indigenous Bear Association, Bar Association. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a, a web website page on the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society about Spirit Bear. Spirit Bear even has their own Twitter page. So it's Twitter account. So just so you know, <laughs> you can follow Spirit Bear on Twitter as well too. Next. So about, about the tribunal orders. So the reason why the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society had to take the government of Canada to court was the government of Canada in this case. So they've taken the government of Canada to court on many, many, many issues. So today I'm just here to talk about Jordan's principle. So just Jordan's principle alone, um, because we don't have enough time. <laughs> so on February 23rd, 2007, so right after Canada just narrowly applied the definition, uh, the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society and the Assembly of First Nations worked together to file a human rights complaint and to the Canadian Human Rights Commission against the government of Canada for providing less child welfare funding to keep them safe and by not implementing Jordan's principle to give them the services they need. So they, for all, in, all children in Canada that are in care, so in child welfare versus Indigenous children in care, they fund the Indigenous child welfare system less. So it's a clear violation of the Human Rights Code where you can't treat people differently because of their race or their culture, clear violation. It's totally against the law and the government of Canada is doing it. 
So on January 26, 2016, uh, the Canada Human Rights Tribunal substantiated the complaint and the ruling. So while this was a significant ruling, there have been many orders from the CHRT after this ruling and also before. So I'm just going to list a few of them. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but I'm going to I'm going to show you a number of the rulings. I'm only going to mention a few. So um, have a look. Um, and uh, these are going backwards, which is a bit weird, but you might have heard in the news in March that the tribunal ordered Canada to fund at actual cost post-majority care to youth aging out of care. So Indigenous children who've um, been through the child welfare system, they were all awarded $40,000 each um, because they were underfunded, they were abused, they were neglected, they weren't given as many services. For example, they didn't have the same access to counselling that non-Native children in care had. They didn't have the same access to food or um, extra funds for clothing and section um, uh, uh, expenses for training or for stuff for sports and stuff like that. So they literally just didn't have the same amount of funding. And so because of this, um, children who'd been in care up to 25 and, and then up to 25, because it's a special case, we're all awarded this. And so this lists a number of other times the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society had to take the government of Canada to court because the government of Canada kept fighting them. Here's some more, including um, 2021, February, the tribunal releases a ruling called a framework of payment of compensation. Here's some more orders. Here's some more because the government of Canada kept fighting instead of just agreeing to a broad definition. Um, September 6, 2019, order for Canada to pay maximum compensation. That was the order that was, that was mentioned. Um, for families who were negatively impacted by Canada's discriminatory practices. Um, January 7th, 2019, order for Canada to pay the complainants and the chiefs of Ontario for compensation for knowingly failing to disclose 90,000 highly relevant documents to the complaint and complainant and for failing to dis advise the CHRT, the court and parties at the earliest opportunity. So in the States, that would be called a Brady violation <laughs> here, like when we watch like law shows all the time. 90,000 documents the government of Canada held back on purpose. Um, so that happened. Um, in May 26, 2017, an order regarding immediately re relief for Jordan's principal, which as we can see up till now still hadn't happened. Um, 2016, order for Canada to update its policies, procedures, and agreements to comply with the findings. So to fully implement Jordan's principles. Um, and again, in 20, April 2016, in order for Canada to fully implement it within two weeks, which clearly it didn't. Um, but the original ruling was that, you know, one of the biggest ru rulings was 2016. The landmark ruling was that kids win, that the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal finds that the Canadian government is racially discriminating against the 165,000 First Nations children in care. And also what was really interesting is, I don't know if any of you remember this in the news when it happened, but when Cindy Blackstock early on first started taking these actions towards the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, uh, the Canadian government sent our secret agencies to follow Cindy Blackstock for years. And they um, went against all of her taxes and they, um, they did all kinds of things to her. So she, there was a, she actually took the government of Canada to court for that too, because there was no reason for them to do it. It was just because she was taking the government to court. So there was an order ruling that Canada engaged in retaliation against Dr. Blackstock and the Caring Society requiring compensation. Um, in 2014, there was an order, they tried to dismiss the Caring Society's motion to amend the rules of evidence. So every time, so look at all the times and the millions of dollars that Indigenous people have to spend just to have our rights equal to the rights of other Canadians. And the millions of dollars of taxpayer money 
the government of Canada is wasting rather than just allowing Indigenous people to have the same rights that other Canadians are already exercising and experiencing. And when you think about it, this is for some of the most vulnerable people in the country, for Indigenous children to have access to health care, to have access to education, to have access to services. Um, in August, so next, in August uh, 2012, there was another order dismissing Canada's request to dismiss the case. So Canada just keeps trying and trying. Next. And if we go down to the one that says November 15th, 2021 ruling, there we go. Um, so this was um, one of Native Child and Family Caring Society's responses um, within one of the rulings themselves. So they were responding to some of the, the legal responses that Canada had said. So they, had, they said on Canada's argument on the Ontario v. Criminal Lawyers case, the tribunal agrees it is bound by the Supreme Court decision in this case, which clarifies the roles of superior courts and the need to show restraint in the areas of public spending and policy. The panel also notes that there was no charter or human rights legislation at play in Ontario um, in 1981 because it started in 1982. So the Ontario Human Rights Code started in 82, the same year that we got our constitution. However, it stated, no one is challenging the general right of the government to allocate resources and manpower as it sees fit, but this right is not unlimited. It must be exercised according to law. The government's right to allocate resources cannot override a statute such as Canadian Human Rights Act. So in Canada's own submissions as part of this motion, Canada acknowledges that it has a legal obligation under the Charter of Human Rights. And to ensure any federally funded services are provided in a non-discriminatory manner. So Canada acknowledges that, but yet they keep wasting millions of taxpayer dollars, and yet they keep discriminating against Indigenous children and families. Next. Next. So like some examples in the media include, um, I don't know if any of you remember when Trudeau first came into power, he may he remember when he well, when he ran for election, he said, I'm a feminist, um, when he ran for the first election, and he also said, I'm an ally. And people were like, Oh, he's so great, we're gonna vote for him. <laughs> and um, then when he came into power, he announced in his first budget, I'm going to allocate $200 million towards Indigenous child welfare. And I remember people in the media saying, oh, isn't that great? Look, he is an ally, just like he said he was. But the court order at the time uh, ordered him to pay $280 million to equalize the Indigenous and child welfare systems. So he, this was a PR stunt. He was trying to say, look at me, I'm really great but he was still actually discriminating against Indigenous people because if the order said $280 million would equalize the system, why would you say that you're gonna do 200 million? And then he, so he only allocated 200 and then he never spent any of it that whole entire year. None of the money was spent. And so this is a cru cru crucial point Canadians need to have more critical capacity when we're looking at Indigenous issues in the Canadian government, because who followed up on that in the media? The media doesn't know to follow up on that. They just follow up on the announcements that the government makes. They don't then say, does that money get spent? And then did it get spent in the right place? Or did it all get spent in the government department? Or did any of it actually make it to Indigenous communities where it was intended? So that becomes really important. And then in 2017, I don't know if you remember, inflation was quite massive. It, the order was up to $340 million, and there was no response by the government of Canada. And then in the 2018 budget, he said he was going to provide an immediate influx of $70 million. And over the next five years, there would be 265 to 295 million per year. But he knew there was an election coming up. And so that's like a classic 
political thing to do before an election, make a bunch of promises. Yeah, but it, but the announcement was it would be a billion dollars. Again, to make him sound good, but you had to read between the lines and say, oh, but that's only 200 something per year. Again, that's less than the tribunal. So can, for Canadians who were uninformed, he was being very sneaky. And again, still discriminating against Indigenous children and families. Next. Um, if we could go to the other attachment. So I was going to say something, but I think that Cindy said it best. Um, so this letter was December 13th, 2021. And um, if you could just scroll with me while I read. John, I'll keep you on your toes. Okay, um, so this was to the courts as well too. Um, and so Cindy wrote this in response to uh, some of the government of Canada's stalling tactics just in December of 2021. So in response to this, this statement from the Honorable Mark Miller, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and the Honorable Patty Hadju, Minister of Indigenous Services regarding ongoing negotiations, as opposed to just saying, yes, we'll pay it. Um, and long-term reform for First Nations Child and Family Services and Jordan's principle. This case is about First Nations children, youth, and families. It is to them that we owe a sacred duty of ensuring their safety and well-being. We are committed to seeing through what the residential school survivors have made their top calls to action. So this is in the TRC calls to action. Ending the discrimination in child welfare and ensuring the full and proper implementation of Jordan's principle. And there is still much work to be done. Negotiations and discussions are ongoing and no agreements have been signed. While the government of Canada has promised to put 40 billion towards ending ongoing discrimination and compensation, the children and families who were hurt is an important step. There are more legal steps to take before victims get the compensation they are owed and First Nations children get the key services they deserve. Part of the government reform and reconciliation is keeping promises to First Nations children, youth, families, and nations. There we go. The government is now paying a high price for now fixing its unequal funding of First Nations children's services. Credible concerns from the government of Canada's own medical health inspector, Dr. P.H. Bryce, were raised as early as 1907, at a time when fixing the, pro the problem would have cost less than $15,000 and saved the lives of countless children in residential schools. Over 20 years ago, fixing the inequalities would only have cost hundreds of millions. The price tag is so high today because the government of Canada did not implement available solutions to address the serious harms to First Nations children and families, despite knowing about the problems for decades. Let this be the lesson that governments need to do better when they know better. The children of the country cannot pass the cost of discrimination down the road by choosing to ignore clear problems with clear solutions. There remain many First Nations children and young adults who are facing inequalities in basic public services from water to education, and there is important work remaining to end the discrimination in Canada's approach to child and family services and Jordan's principle. They are owed a duty of justice that lives beyond monetary compensation. We must hear their voices and push for full implementation of the reforms necessary to ensure the discrimination stops now and that Canada does not hurt another generation of Indigenous children again. We will continue our efforts to implement reform of Indigenous Services Canada to end the injustice and secure a safe, bright, and promising future for First Nations children and families. And that's from Cindy Blackstock. Awesome, Cindy Blackstock. So we can go back to the uh, presentation, please. So um, for while there are many applications of Jordan's principle, we've only talked about healthcare and child welfare. There's also Indigenous children, there's also uh, Indigenous prisoners access to physical, mental health and cultural care. And there's there's far more uh, broader implications of Jordan's principle as well, too. So next. May 10th is Bear Witness Day. 
and Spirit Bear's birthday. And you can follow Spirit Bear on Twitter at Spirit Bear. And you can follow the First Nations Caring Society on Twitter at FN Caring Society. And there's also a film that's available, Spirit Bear's film. It's called Spirit Bear and Children Make History. And it's free right now and available to watch until May 11th. Um, and that's the address, but the, um, we can make sure it's available on your Facebook page. And it, I highly recommend, um, if you're looking for a place to donate, to donate to the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society website, you can do one-time donation or regular donations, but um, they're there to support Indigenous children and families. Um, and unfortunately, because we're fighting against a government that's just not willing to just make the right choices on their own. Um, it's very costly and takes a long time. And that's it. So any questions? <laughs>